all comes the real highlight, the centerpiece, as it were, of the Sunday service. It is the message by our speaker. Our speaker, whose name I mentioned earlier, is Reverend Anne Shand. And she is a tower of strength, small though her frame is, a tower of strength. Um, somebody who is extremely dependable. Everything sort of filters through her and our pastor, Reverend John. She is an invaluable assistant to her, to, to him. And her talks are always, always inspirational, often Bible-based. And today, I gather, she's talking about emancipation and independence. I will sit back and listen as Reverend Anne addresses me. Reverend Anne. Thank you, Reverend Michael. Good morning again. Welcome, welcome to all joining us this beautiful morning in the sanctuary of our beloved temple and to those of our virtual family of friends. Thank you for joining us this morning. Today, we celebrate the significance of emancipation in establishing a life more abundant. Emancipation is a factor, a recurring one, as we seek to create our life experience on this plane of existence. Emancipation is a key element. I have chosen to share my thoughts under the topic of emancipate yourself, the gateway towards limitless living. I am reminded of one of our Declaration of Principles, and I quote, we believe the ultimate goal of life to be a complete emancipation of all discord of every nature, and that this goal is sure to be attained by all, end of quote. The Latin origin of the noun emancipation comes from emancipare, transfer as property, thereby giving way to the meaning as stated in the Oxford Dictionary. A, free from legal, social, and political restrictions, and two, free from slavery. So one can establish the historical significance in terms of the freedom from slavery centuries ago. But we are more than our legal, social, and political status. And then there is, and I quote, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Words of our hero, Marcus Garvey, immortalized by Honorable Robert Nesta Mali. This points definitively to the key element in that declaration, emancipation from all discord of every nature, all and not limited to legal, social, and political agendas. Therefore, the foundation of limitless living is there is nothing to stop, delay, or restrict the full expression of life for abundant for every single individual. If a renewed state of mind is the ultimate, emancipation is the charge. Psalm 142 verse 7 states, and I quote, bring my soul out of prison that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about for thou shalt deal bountifully with me, end of quote. In other words, free my soul from any sort of restriction that I may praise, worship, appreciate the presence of God within me. I am that I am. With right useness of the mind, spontaneous right action takes place in all my affairs, and I am blessed with the abundant bounty of spirit. Just as in Redemption Song, we free ourselves from restricted thinking 
limited beliefs by embodying mentally, spiritually, uplifting thought patterns. Once we are realized this through the presence of God within, we can truly emancipate our souls from mental slavery. Here's an instructional story told by Emmett Fox in his book of Daily Meditations Around. It is a story taken from the very Middle Ages. But if you must let go of any belief that does not support your growth and unfoldment, this tale aptly describes the process. And I begin with this story. It seems that a certain citizen was arrested by one of the barons and shut up in a dungeon by a ferocious looking jailer who carried a great key. The door of his cell shut with a bang. He lay in the dark dungeon for 20 years. Each day the big door would be opened with a great creaking. Water and bread would be thrust in and the door closed again. After 20 years, the prisoner decided that he wanted to die and did not, but he did not want to commit suicide. So the next day, he thought, when the, jailer, when the jailer came, he would attack him, and the jailer would then kill him. Solution. Mm. In preparation, he thought he should examine the door. So he turned the handle, and to his amazement, the door opened. He found that there was no lock. He groped along the corridor and felt his way upwards. At the top of the stairs, two soldiers were chatting, and they made no attempt to stop him. He crossed the great yard. There was an armed guard on the drawbridge who paid no attention to him, and he walked out a free man. He went home unmolested. He had been a captive, not of stone and iron but of false belief. He had only thought he was locked in. Let us look at every aspect of the story. It could be anybody's story. It needs contemplating in order to understand the idea behind emancipating oneself from mental slavery, any discord of any nature. Once we have accepted an idea, thought, mental pattern, belief not in line with our freedom to experience the, ex the presence of God within it becomes our barrel that will arrest, place us in a dungeon with a ferocious looking jailer. We are faced with the undesirable issue or condition that we respond to it from the prison of fear, anxiety, hate, unforgiveness, suffering any discomfort what we can name that point to our separation from our good. Our jailer of limited thinking keeps us for 20 years, a multiple of five, which means a period when the effects of the limited thinking takes full control of our five senses, the material sense, the exterior fills our mind with every scenario of negative experiences, but notice we are fed with water and bread during the period. Snippets of truth embedded within and without feeds our consciousness, reminding us that this condition can be transformed. Some ideas of truth may come into our lives with great creaking, but nevertheless, the door to inner realization still opens from inside of us. And as we accept gradually the water of spirit and the bread of spiritual substance until we come to our senses, just as in that story of the young man, in the story of the prodigal son, we are now ready to die to negative, limited thinking. So we examine our consciousness through inspiration from within. We are now subject to the still small voice of truth and with the assistance of affirmations, affirmative prayers self-created, 
or from a practitioner of our teaching, or simply reminding ourselves of Reverend John's past message. Affirm, believe, claim, you remember that? ABC? Okay. So we affirm, believe, and claim the victory of emancipation from what it is we do not want to that of the mental equivalent of the desired good. It is not the easiest thing to do to maintain this new mental equivalent of desired good while the condition appears in our external world through reminders from well thinking channels of how will we manage or from the social or any other media reminding us that the world is going through hell in a handbasket. But it is the time, Hona, that we must use the water and bread of the spirit to take a stand. Examine the door of consciousness, preparing that consciousness with whatever spiritual practice that resonates with us. And yet there are times the words of truth cannot come to mind readily. Just sit in silence, open to receiving strength and courage to sustain us through the layers of transformation taking place within our minds. As this process takes place, we are guided by spirit as to what path to take, what book to read, what prayers to say, until from the deep recesses of our mind, the victory of a renewed mental pattern announces itself. While this is taking place, faith sustains us. That faith of Hebrews 11 verse 1, and I quote, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see, end of quote. Yes, the door of freedom has opened. And as we grow our way up in consciousness until we get to a higher vibration that ushers in our demonstration of the desired good. Yes, we walk past the guards. The arm guards on the drawbridge, those are temptations to desert the truth. But we are blind to them, and we walk home unmolested to a perfect manifestation of good. Dr. Holmes, the founder of our teaching, The Science of Mind and Spirit, states, and I quote, the freedom of truth dispels all doubt, casts out all fear, dissolves every antagonistic thought and establishes in mind the joyous recognition that good alone is real and eternal and that the truth triumphs over every false thought or manifestation end of quote yes only good alone is real and that truth must stand in the face of anything that is unlike it but on a deeper level the very belief of bondage must change once we focus that it has no power over us. But indeed it is a channel through which only good is the reality. Please join me in this affirmation sent to me by one of our temple stalwarts. It was authored by John Asaroff of its secret fame. I'll say it again and then you repeat after me. My life is free from negativity and drama. I surround myself with light and love. Together, my life is free from negativity and drama. I surround myself with light and love. And in a half voice, my life is free from negativity and drama. I surround myself with light and love. Yes, once our hearts are filled with love and light, we begin to focus on the essence of our desired good. Emancipation must bear fruit as we move from what does not serve our growth and fulfillment to that of the experience of greater good. Alan Cohen, motivational speaker and author of the book, Lifestyles of the Rich in Spirit, tells a true story. Please listen carefully without judgment. I begin the story. There was a woman who was married to a very cold and emotionally insensitive man. 
For many years, the man did not show his feelings or acknowledge his wife's love for him. Often over the years, she thought about leaving him, and at times she almost did. But each time she was about to walk away out the door, a voice within her heart told her to stay. And so she did. Many years passed. Still the man showed little appreciation for this devoted woman. She often wondered where it was all leading to. Then the husband passed away. The wife came to the family safe deposit box to collect her valuables. And there she found a letter that her husband had written to her some time before he passed away. The letter said, Dear Betty, I want you to know how much I love and appreciate you. As you know, I'm a man who does not show his feelings very much or very well. But that does not mean I do not feel. It, it has been very difficult for me to, expre to express appreciation and perhaps that is why I'm writing this letter to you instead of speaking what I want to say. Betty, I have been aware of all the kindnesses and thoughtful acts you have done for me over all these years. You have been a wonderfully devoted and giving wife, and I want to acknowledge you for it. Please do not ever feel that what you have done with me and for me has gone unnoticed and unappreciated. I am thankful for all of it. Please know that I love you, I value you, and I'm very grateful for our years together. God bless you for being such an angel in my life. Always. John. <laughs> the power of loving acts. This woman listened to her heart. She did not separate herself from her husband in thought or deed. She never left the marriage once she listened to that still small voice. She allowed the intuitive guidance of spirit to lead her through the challenging experience. Her faith was undaunted, thereby freeing her to act in love, be love, and be the epitome of devotion. Every act of kindness, every thought of love was deeply imprinted in her husband's mind. So he could leave that declaration of love that cemented that she dwelt in a home of love, although physically it was not seen. Let us consider the story and its message to us on this special day. Let who has ears hear every word of that letter. Because friends, we are offsprings of divine love. Our emancipated spirits can express a powerful wave that must lead to transformation at every level of conscious awareness. We share this one mind and we are one with spirit. Then seeking to emancipate ourselves is a responsibility. Dare might I say an obligation. Yes, we are not here to build monuments for ourselves through acts of service. But when one loves freely, every act is one of unqualified service that must usher in a new way of limitless living. This shift in ourselves must facilitate how we look at all who we come into contact with. All must be respected. All are valued and all are appreciated. It takes time to steadily build a consciousness that is filled with spontaneous, untrammeled love 
for every living thing, including lizards. But it is still life. Earlier, I mentioned the use of spiritual practices. But there are other conscious and deliberate methods one can use in our daily lives to practice love. We can spontaneously smile with everyone. We can give a compliment to persons who may not expect it. We can deliberately do acts of kindness that will not identify us. And if there's an area in our life that needs attention, start visioning with spirit. And once led to take action, deeply and daily visualize that desire for good. Visualize, place a mental picture in mind that represents how we feel through the physical manifestation of this desired good. Charles Simon in 1965 published an article in the magazine published by the Minister of Prayer, an organization under the auspices of our very own Centers for Spiritual Living. It goes like this, and I quote, let us embrace the truth which sets all people free, that God's spirit indwells every person, and the spirit's gift of wisdom understanding and peace will enter our experience by our own belief in and acceptance of them. End of quote. So friends, today let us continue to practice in love, see all in love, extending our hands in love, and emancipate ourselves into limitless living. We are cause and we are love. Namaste.